There is no period in a woman's life where she's more exposed to useless statistics and preconceptions than when she's trying to conceive and when she's pregnant. It covers everything from which food she's supposed to eat to which sexual position is the most likely to get her pregnant. For me, it started already before trying to conceive, with my mom telling me, Oh, you got to be fertile. I was super fertile. Thanks, mom, but don't you think most people had fertile parents? <laughs> uh, when my husband and I started trying to conceive, the misconceptions about my body started lining up. I had just gotten off the pill, and I naively assumed I would have 28-day cycles, and I would ovulate on day 15, because that's what the average woman does. About a week after my assumed ovulation, I would get this pain in my lower abdomen, which I would interpret as the first signs of pregnancy. My expectations would go through the roof every month, but the months kept passing by, and no baby on the way. What I felt was ovulation pain. I was ovulating much later than I thought. Everything I had learned about the average female body simply didn't apply to me. My favorite Swedish poet, Karin Boye, wrote, yes, there is goal and meaning with our journey, but it's the way there that is worth our while. I believe that to be true with everything in life, except this particular journey. Uh, what starts out as a fun, seductive game completely loses its charm after six months when you come to your partner with sad, hollow eyes saying, we must have sex now. It's not a turn-on, I can tell you. However, going through this journey, together with my husband, turned out to be a great experience for what was to become my next step. As head of data science at Ava, a Swiss startup, I spent the last four years in a team helping other couples get pregnant faster by using data from their menstrual cycles to build algorithms, telling them when is the best time for them to conceive. There's a huge gap between what the statistics tell you about the average female cycle and the individual cycle of a woman. This is the gap we've been trying to bridge using data and algorithms. When we think about the cycle, we mainly think about the bleeding. But that is actually the least interesting part, and just a sign that everything is working as it should and that our bodies are doing its job. The bleeding marks the beginning and the end of the cycle. So that's easy enough to recognize, but it's much trickier to recognize what's happening in between. Ovulation happens one, somewhere in the middle of the cycle. And if you want to get pregnant, this is what you're interested in. It's only during the six days leading up to ovulation that you can actually get pregnant. Or to be honest, this number is also statistics. So for you, it can be anything between two and a half and seven and a half days, depending on your age and other factors. So what can you do to figure out when your fertile days are? To explain that, I would first like to tell you a little bit about how the hormones changes over the cycle. And I will especially focus on two of them, because they are important not only for your fertility, but because they influence your entire body. And these are estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen starts to rise during the second quarter of your cycle, and this is your fertile phase. Many of us become more aroused in this phase, which is, of course, a smart trick of nature to make sure we keep reproducing. Apparently, we're also more attractive in this phase. Studies have shown that lap dancers receive more tip if they're working in their fertile phase. <laughs> Around ovulation, progesterone starts to rise. The role of the progesterone is to build up the wall of the uterus so that if fertilized, the egg can implant and start growing. If the egg is not fertilized and you're not pregnant, all the hormones will drop back to the baseline again. It's actually this drop that is believed to be the reasons behind premenstrual syndrome. So if someone ever tells you you're being hormonal at the end of your cycle, they couldn't be more wrong. It's quite the opposite, actually. So next question. What 
can you do and how can you use data to understand how your hormones are changing? Let me show you. This is my own menstrual cycle. What you see is how I've tracked three different physiological parameters over the cycle. It's pulse rate, temperature, and breathing rate. All those fluctuations you see over the cycle are linked to my changing hormones. If you first look at pulse rate, you see that pulse rate starts to increase already during my fertile phase, as an indication that I will soon ovulate. Seeing that pulse rate increases already before ovulation is surprisingly a very new finding that was only possible due to the new wearable technologies on the market. This is, of course, something we have used in our algorithms to help other women find out when they are fertile. If you now look at temperature and breathing rate, you can see that both of them start to increase just after my fertile phase. That is a progesterone that has kicked in. And it's driving all those parameters up. This is a good sign. It means that I have been ovulating and that my hormones are in balance. You must, however, be very careful and know the limitations of the methods you use to track your cycle. An example of how sensitive your data can be, you can see here in the beginning in pulse rate, you suddenly see a strong spike in pulse rate. That, I'm afraid, uh, is a little bit too much alcohol. Um, <laughs> Knowing what alcohol does to my data is also why I chose not to track my data here on May 18th, which all my fellow Swedes would know was Eurovision night. <laughs> yeah, I know, not so cool in Switzerland, but I'm Swedish after all. <laughs> so, if you're not trying to get pregnant, why should you even care about your menstrual cycle? A healthy cycle is important for so many factors linked to your health. The balance between estrogen and progesterone are crucial factors to protect you against heart disease, osteoporosis, dementia, and much more. Even though it turned out myself, I was perfectly within the statistical distribution, both with regards to my cycles and to the outcome of our efforts. It was still a hard struggle, with a lot of strains on our relationship. It would have helped us so much if I would have known my body better at that time, because statistics did not help us conceive. There were, however, other moments when statistics did help us, like the time I went for the first ultrasound, and it turned out that the fetus didn't have a heartbeat. It never feels like statistics to you, but knowing that 15 to 25 percent of all pregnancies end with miscarriage, within the first 12 weeks, could at least help us know that we were normal, so we didn't panic. I'm not saying that technology will solve all your troubles. But as you see, by tracking your physiological data, you can not only understand when you're fertile, you can also get an indication if your hormones are varying as they should. Modern wearable technologies can be a great help, but it's not the only way. Simply paying attention to the more subtle signs of your body can also help. You can either learn how to interpret the data yourself, or you can have algorithms help you do the job. We are so much more than what statistics reduce us to. Statistics is there to spot the rare outliers and to tell the doctors when we need treatment. It can also comfort us to help us know that we are within the norm. So do learn about the stats. But remember, within what's considered normal, there can still be a huge variation. And just as the averages did not help me, they will probably not help you. So if I can give you some advice, make sure to track your data, even if it's only for a short while. Because only with your own personal data can you hack into them and truly understand your own body. Thank you. <laughs>